Thank you, choir, for the song of such comfort. Uh, it is very comforting to believe and know that our Lord is leading Zion Church. Amen. And I believe that he has led you to this sanctuary and to this worship service today. And may God's blessings, overflowing blessings and comfort, uh, comforting be upon you and your family today. Amen. The title for today's title, uh, today's message is True Worshippers, Samaritan Woman. Uh, as I mentioned last week, uh, we are starting a small series during this time of Lent, and we are, I have decided to title this series, True Worshippers. And today we're going to think about the Samaritan woman. And uh, Samaritan woman is somebody that we are very familiar with, and I have shared, even recently, on Wednesday, about Samaritan woman. But uh, in this series, in the Gospel of John, uh, and we have studied last week about how John presents Jesus as the true tabernacle and the new temple. And the purpose of the tabernacle and temple in, in the Old Testament is for people of God to be redeemed and restored in the relationship with God. And so it's a way, it's a path, it's the means. And John presents Jesus as the tabernacle. And tabernacle, as Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father without coming through me, right? And therefore, the purpose in John's presentation of Jesus as the temple is not just the fact that Jesus is the temple. The ultimate purpose is who will be saved through that temple? Who are the people who will come and meet the Father and receive life? And Apostle John clearly states that purpose of the gospel in John chapter 20, verse 31. He says, I write this, this writing, the purpose of this writing is so the readers can, may believe that Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and have life in his name by believing. And so we are going to focus on those who have come to meet Jesus and have come to believe in Jesus. And there are other people in the gospel uh, that have met Jesus. So in, in general categories, there are people who meet Jesus and do not believe. There are people who meet Jesus and come to believe. Let us ask ourselves, which category do I fall in? Because people like Nicodemus that we are skipping today uh, in this series have come to Jesus, and we will talk about this a little bit later, a little bit more, saying that, you, I believe that you are a rabbi, you are a teacher, good teacher, sent from God. He believes to an extent. He recognizes who Jesus is. But Jesus ends up asking him, how will you believe if you cannot believe when I speak to you of the earthly things, I speak to you of the earthly things you still do not believe. How will you believe if I speak to you of the heavenly things? Nicodemus' faith just stayed as status quo, even after meeting Jesus. But then there are people who, whose faith come to grow and come closer and come to realize that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And receive life. So just as the purpose of the tabernacle was to allow God's people to come back to God and worship Him. Jesus' purpose as the tabernacle was for the people to come to Him to meet the Father. And hence, naturally, we shift our focus to, the, to those who meet Jesus, come to believe, so that we can learn from them. Because... They represent us. The ultimate purpose in God's work of redemption, redemption history, the ultimate purpose of God's work in restoring the temple is to redeem the true worshipers, to redeem Adam in the Garden of Eden. So let us take these few weeks to think about those who came to Jesus and believed in Him. 
We are skipping a few people, even among those who come to meet Jesus and believe in Jesus, such as in chapter 1, there's John the Baptist, and then there's uh, Nathaniel. But we, are, we don't have that many weeks in the time of Lent, so if we have time, we'll come back to them, but uh, we are skipping them for now. And so, there, among the people who come to meet Jesus and believe in Jesus, there are some common traits. And what are the common traits in these people who come to believe in Jesus? And I, I shared this last week at the end also, and I pray that we, you and I, will share these, some of these common traits also. First, they are representative of those who are redeemed and those who are saved through Jesus. So these people that we are going to be looking at, focusing on, represent us who come to believe in Jesus. Their background, the process, and the end result. Secondly, there were changes made by Jesus in their life. And third, they go through a process of believing in Jesus. There's a process of coming to believe in Jesus. And since we're not going to spend too much time with Nathaniel, I'll take Nathaniel as an example. Nathaniel was introduced to Jesus by Philip. So Jesus calls Andrew, Andrew calls Philip and Peter, and, and then Philip invites, uh, introduces Nathaniel to Jesus. Nathaniel didn't know anything about Jesus, but when Jesus sees Nathaniel, to, to Nathaniel, Jesus was just nobody, somebody. But when Jesus sees Nathaniel, he says, a true Israelite without guile. And Nathaniel says, how do you know? And Jesus, so f- the first stage is, hi, mister, who are you? Kind of thing. Same with you and me. When Jesus when this religious religion of Christianity or Jesus or God first was introduced to us, we were like, who is this? What kind of, what kind of church is this? Right? And then Nathaniel asked Jesus, how do you know me? Jesus says, I knew you since you were under that fig tree. Myst- astounding, mysterious. How do you know me? How how did you see me? I didn't see you then. And so Jesus reveals a little bit about himself that is out of the ordinary, that catches the attention. And he's wondering, who are you now? Because under that fig tree, nobody saw me. And what uh, all the Jews, uh, Jewish readers, would understand what he was doing under that fig tree. What do you think he was doing under that fig tree? Don't think, don't think darkness here. (laughs) Usually what people do under the fig tree is reading the Torah, studying the Torah. So what he was, he wanted, Nathaniel wanted to understand the word. And Jesus, when Jesus says, I saw you under that fig tree, meaning I saw you reading the Bible studying the word, trying to come to know me. And basically he's saying, I know, I, because Nathaniel was praying to God. And Jesus, Jesus is the one that responds. He says, I saw you there. And it's not just, oh, how did you see me? Did you see me on YouTube? It's not that kind of scene. Nathaniel was taken, taken back because this man knows me. He knows my heart. And then, suddenly he says, you must be the Christ. Sudden conversion. I think this is the fastest conversion that took place ever. But although this is explained in such a short time, this is a process that you and I go through. We don't know God, but He approaches us. And we ask Him, who are you? And then we find out, He's not just an ordinary man. He's not just an ordinary uh, idol or God. He's powerful. He knows me. And then we come to realize He is the true God. He is Christ, the Messiah. And so these people that uh, go through some kind of process that is similar to Nathaniel's example here. And then next, 
common thing is that there is a clear statement or action that they come to that caused them to believe in Jesus. Jesus does something or says something, and then John clearly defines or, or states that they believed in Jesus, or they confess, I believe in you, or they confess, you are the Christ, or they do the action, they, they show it through their action. And lastly, they become witnesses. Other people come to believe in Jesus because of them. So how many of these apply to you and me today? So today, let us think about the Samaritan woman, how Jesus met, her interaction with him. So first point, who was she? The Samaritan woman, who was she? She was unclean. We know from the passage. Uh, we are going to continue on reading from verse 9. We read up to verse 8 today. But she had five husbands before, living with one now, probably not legally uh, married. So she has a not very proud, not very uh, presentable past. Born a Samaritan. Samaritans are those whom the Jews considered most spiritually defiled, repugnant, abhorred. They abhorred the Samaritans. Her personal life was in a mess, having gone through five husbands before, living with one now. And her religious life was unsure. She represents the type. She probably hated herself Everything about herself and everything around her. Anybody here like that? War was like that? Then Jesus approaches her and asks for water. Interesting how Jesus approaches her. He doesn't have to go through Samaria. Usually they don't go through Samaria as Jews. They go around. But somehow Jesus comes and he rests at this well as if he's waiting for somebody. He lets the disciples go find, uh, to go find food and he's just sitting there. And this woman comes. Is he fl flirting with this woman? Can you, can you imagine what kind of dressing or what kind of attire or presentation she must have had? The kind of woman she is? What, what's, what's he doing talking to her? Jews don't talk to Samaritans, especially women, especially indecent women. And she is also wondering, who are you? Why are you talking to me? And then he suddenly asks her, give me a drink. God comes to us sometimes at the most unexpected place and time. Usually when we are not ready for him. And he asks of us something. I'm not only talking about offering. Water in the Bible represents different things, but we'll come to that later. But he's, and sometimes we don't have that thing that he's asking for. So let us think, let us look into the interaction a little in more detail as a second point. So the second main point is changes that took place in the Samaritan woman. The interaction between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Let us read verses 9 through 11 first. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with, the Samar with Samaritans. So first thing Jesus says, Give me a drink. And the woman is wondering. And she calls him, you are a Jew. Okay? Look at, let us pay attention to what, how she addresses Jesus. You're a Jew. Basically saying, hey mister. Yeah. And suddenly he's asking her of something. Okay? Water. God requests us 
of us, sometimes, money, time, dedication, heart. But sometimes it comes to us when we don't have it. In this passage, we can see that Jesus is not asking for literal water. In the biblical understanding, water is what carries life. See, when, uh, babies, when mother ba- carries the baby, she carries it in water, in the womb. Right? Water is needed. And, and they call, in Hebrew, it's called ma'im chaim. Right? Water of life. Water contains life. And so what Jesus is asking her is, give me your life. <laughs> That's even harder than giving him some of that well water. She's not ready. How about you and me? God approaches us at times when it is most unexpected, when we are most not ready, when we actually want to say, God, can you... Uh, can you come at another time, please? You know, at, at times, do you, do you do, I, I don't know if I'm the only one, but do you find yourself in situations where you don't have any more threshold to, to take any more thing? It's just, your head is about to burst. Too many things and too many concerns, too many worries and too many problems. And when kids come to you, like, can you leave me alone? You cannot even take your own family members. And God comes to you. Not with comforting, not with more money or more blessings. He says, can you give me this? Can you give me more time? God, I don't even have time to eat right now. I don't even have time to sleep enough. God says, can you give me some offering? God, look at my bank account. No more. What he requests of of us is our water. He wants our heart, our life. Just like Elijah, when he came to the widow of, of Zarephath, he asked her of the last handful of flour that she had, that last piece of bread that she was going to eat and die. Elijah says, give it to me first. Same thing God does to us sometimes. So are we ready, are you ready to give up your temporary mammon for the eternal life that He is about to give us? Which is more important, realistically, right now, practically, which is more important? Can you put a hold on the, can you say, God, can you put a hold on that eternal life? I'll take it later, but right now I need this right now. This woman came to the well with so much problem. Why did she come out to the well scorching scorching sun, under the scorching sun of noontime, the sixth hour? Because she was probably so frustrated. Even her home, she couldn't find rest. She needed to come out and somehow find a way to live and survive. And she was probably saying, she could have said, Jesus, I have enough problem of my own. Can you leave me alone? Who are you anyway? Why are you asking me for that water? There's other people. How how long have you been avoiding Jesus and His request? When God is asking of us something, He's requesting something from us, He doesn't always do it when we are overflowing and plentiful. He tells us to give some time to serve, serve Him when we don't have time. He tells us to give some offering when we don't have money. He tells us to believe Him when we don't have faith. The Lord came to each one of you and me in such a manner. So she's wondering. She's asking. And then, second thing Jesus asks. Jesus says, Whoever drinks of this water that I will give him shall never thirst. 
sudden change. John chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Just like with Nathaniel, Jesus says something that throws her off. It's, it's, it's not, it's, you don't know where to place this. He says, I'll give, I, if you knew me, you would be asking me for water. Or, or, you just asked me for water. And you're saying you can give me better water? See, that's, that's the next thing, next step that we come to realize. God is asking of us, but we come to realize He can give me something better. He's the one that can give me more blessings. Right? But the problem is, she says, but you don't have any bucket. Nothing to draw with. And that's why the, the big question, who are you? Who is this? But you and I know. You and I know. What she wants. It doesn't really matter who he is. If he can give me that blessing, I want it. That's, what, that's how we got drawn to Jesus. We got drawn not because of who he is, but because of the bless, blessings that, that he can give me. She came out to draw some water because she is so thirsty. Maybe it speaks about her life where her thirst is never quenched. And so she came out to this well, wanting to satisfy her temporarily. There sits Jesus waiting for me, waiting for her. And he finally says something that I wanted to hear. He has something that I want. Water that I can drink and will never thirst again. And it's not this well water. I pray that you may find that in Jesus who came to you, asking you for your water. Now, are you ready to give that water to him? She says, Sir, give me that water. How does she address him now? It was from, You're a Jew, Mr. to Sir. What is Sir? In the original language, it's Lord. Curious. Lord. See, our, our attitude towards God also changes when we realize He can give me something. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know how you're going to give it to me. In looking at you, you don't have a bucket, you, do, you got nothing. But still, if it is true, if what you say is true, I want that. Do you want it? No? Are you, are you listening? <laughs> you, you don't, you're not responding because you're saying, I already have it, don't worry. So she says, can I have some of that water? Third thing that Jesus says, go, call your husband and come here. Uh, she asked for that blessing. Can you, why can't you give it to me without condition? Isn't that how we want our blessings? But Jesus reaches deep into my life and brings out that thing that I don't want to reveal. Raise your hand if you don't have anything that you, you're hiding. Everybody, I think, has something that we want to cover up. She, it's her past that she wanted to hide. Something that she wanted to conceal and cover up. And she doesn't want to talk about it anymore. Ever. She doesn't want anybody to talk about it. If anybody talks about it, she gets offended. Her past. Herself. Let us read verses 16 through 19. He said to her, go, call your husband and come here. How does the woman respond? The woman answered and said, I have no husband. 
See, she doesn't want to talk about it. She hides it. She lies. Jesus said to her, you have, you have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This is, this you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. She realizes when Jesus talks about it, and nobody talked about this probably. Everybody was probably in, behind her back, just pointing fingers at her, gossiping about her. She realized, however, that that thing, that thing that she wants to cover up, layer over layer over layer, that is what causes her from being happy. That's what causes her eternal thirst that can never be quenched. Do you have that today? Do we have that? If you don't, you are a truly blessed person. So she lies. She's not brave enough to face it. She's not courageous enough to accept the fact that she has that dark side and past. This is why you and I put up social makeup. What do you do when you put up makeup? Why? Uh, let me ask. Um, uh, these days, men put on makeup too, I guess. Uh, but let me ask you generally, you know, men and women, uh, why do you put on makeup? Am I, am I crossing over into a topic that we don't want to talk about? Why do we put on makeup? Two answers. To cover. Second, to beautify to make myself more presentable. True? Yes, yes. I'm not, I'm not against makeup. Yeah. I'm against myself putting on makeup. But, uh, <laughs> but we do that, you know, not in a negative sense, but in a positive sense. Right? So we can be presentable. However, we are covering up our freckles and <laughs> different sometimes wrinkles even and you know no eyebrow thing and all that right we're making ourselves more presentable what's the, what's an important aspect of a life with makeup there are people who want to really cover up put on and not enough put on you know on <laughs> And almost becoming a mask. Not recognizable when the makeup is off. Different person. What's the important thing? Those who, are, who, uh, who put on makeup every day. Every evening, when you come home, what do you have to do? For the health of your skin, cleansing is very important. Your skin needs some time to breathe, right? Right? No? Yeah. What happens if you don't? You just sleep with the makeup on every day. What happens? One day, you take off your ma uh, mask and ma makeup, your husband will be, ah! <laughs> yeah. Who is that? <laughs> Our skins will go bad. <laughs> you know, something bad will happen. That's this woman. I'm not talking about only facial makeup here. We're talking about our behaviors, our social kind of makeup that we put on, covering layers. There are people who are very sad and very, very sorrow and lonely inside, but in front of the people, they are very jovial, very funny. They're always bright to cover up their darkness inside. There are people who come off as very strong character, but inside they're very tender and very weak, and they put off that strong character so that they can protect themselves. They're afraid that they might get hurt. There are people who, who cover up their insecurities with the authoritative force or, or pose Whatever they, they, they can put up outside. Why? 
mostly because they are hurt inside and they don't want that to be touched. Mostly because they're afraid they might get hurt again. It's for the sake of protection. They're afraid to let their own self be shown to others. And we all put on makeup to some kind of degree. We all have something that we want to, sh- to cover up and hide. But Jesus says, if you want this blessing, she, she says, give me that water. Jesus says, bring your husband. Wow. Can you and I, is there a place, is there a, a, a group of people or, or any, at least a person and time where you can take off your makeup and be yourself? It's usually at home, right? But I'm talking about this spiritual makeup, covering. Is there any place, anybody to whom you can show your real self? That Allah, if, if, we cannot, if we don't have that, if we cannot do that, our soul will not be able to breathe, just like that skin. Are you able to breathe? Right now. She is suffocating the Samaritan woman. There's no place where she can breathe. So she comes out into this well. And Jesus says, bring your husband. What does he mean? Take off your mask. Take off your makeup. She's afraid. Because every time she did that, for the past five husbands, she got hurt more. Every time she tried to take off her makeup or show her real self, she was beaten down. She was criticized. She was not accepted. But Jesus says, you're right. When you say you don't have a husband. Why? Because I erased that just now. It's gone. No more. No more. May Jesus say that to you today. The thing that you want to hide, the thing, the, the, the thing that you want, you're so afraid that other people might point fingers at, Jesus says, you don't have that anymore. No more. How? Go to some kind of ceremony? Some kind of ritual? No. Just because Jesus said it. It's too easy that it's so hard to believe. Can you believe today that Jesus reached in and took that cancerous cell out and threw it away? Amen? Amen. Our past, the thing that we want to cover up. So now you can breathe. Shall we practice? (sighs) You're still holding your breath. One more time. Ready? Not only physically, let's spiritually breathe. Jesus allows that for us. Even our spouse, our children, our parents may not accept us. But come to Jesus. He says, it's okay. It's okay, you're right. I know you lied, but you're right. Because I made it right. Your past is gone. That... See, God is a great constructor. We sang in the, the last song, we build ourselves upon the Lord, right? He's a great constructor. But if the bottom foundation has a hole or some kind of sewage under sewer or something rotting underneath, eventually it'll collapse. Or we can think about old buildings in, like in Rome or places like that. Old buildings that we want to preserve. You cannot just put more things on top of the old thing. It will fall down or collapse eventually. See, God doesn't... It's, it's usually easier and cheaper to destroy and rebuild a new one. But God does not do that. God preserves us, our identity, our structure, but He changes 
He changes everything. He's been doing that for the last six, seven thousand years of history. And that's called history of redemption. And after being washed of her past sins, she finally says, I perceive that you're a prophet. And then she asks about worship. The fourth thing that Jesus says, An hour is coming when now is, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father. John chapter 4, verses 20 through 24. Our Father, and she says, Our Father is worshipped in this mountain. This is Mount Gerizim, northern kingdom of Israel, where Jeroboam built a temple. And then there is another temple in Jerusalem. So that's what she is referring to. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So she, her question is, where are, am I supposed to worship? Because of all the rules and regulations and different sets of, of customs and traditions that people have made, she's confused. She's actually troubled by this faith. And even when she worships, she doesn't, she's not sure if God is receiving my worship. Even when you sit through worship service, do you, sometimes we feel like, who did I worship? Is God, was God there? I hope that's never the case in Zion Church. But that's what she felt like. So she asks that question about where to worship. Verse 21, Jesus answered and said to her, this is Jesus' answer. Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. She asks where and he answers when. And what, when is that? He says, there is this hour coming. And in, in Greek, it's hora. And we learned, I think I shared uh, several times about this, the significance of hora. This is hour. But... In the Gospel of John, Hora is used to refer, refer to the time of Jesus' glory on the cross. And secondly, about the time when Jesus speaks the word and it matches with the faith that receives that word. Just like two hands are needed to come together to make a clap sound, Jesus' word and the faith that receives the word when they come together, that is the Hora time. And we saw that, we see that in Mary, Jesus' mother, in John chapter 2, and Matthew chapter 8, the centurion, you know, he says, my servant is sick. Jesus says, I'll come with you. He says, no, no, you speak the word. He goes back, and he finds out the hour when Jesus spoke the word, he was healed. The Canaanite woman, also. So Jesus says, the hour is coming. And it's not about what time. What time is coming? It's not, it's not like, you know, all of you wondering, uh, in five minutes it's 12, will he finish? I will finish when the hora comes. <laughs> so Jesus, Jesus says, the hour is coming. What hour? They're at the sixth hour. Is it the seventh hour? No. What hour? Did that hour come? Verses 25 and 26. The woman said to him, When Jesus said, The hour is coming, and now is. Jesus says, Now is. When the people of God will worship God in spirit and truth. And so, when became when. Oh, no, no. Where became when. And when became how. Worship in spirit and truth. Okay. And she, she asked him, she said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. She's catching on to this word. Jesus is testifying, Jesus is teaching her this word. And she's catching on. She, Jesus says, the hour is coming. And she, she catches on and she says, okay, the hour is about when the Christ, when the Messiah comes. Right? And so she speaks about that. I know the Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. 
When that one comes, see that hour, when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Wow. The hour came or not? Jesus, Jesus says the hour is coming. She interprets it as when Christ comes. And Jesus says, I am. So now it becomes who. The hour is who. Right? And, she, and Jesus says, I am. And did she believe? She leaves the water, bar, uh, water jar, jar and goes back to her town full of people that used to point fingers at her, right? And she says, I think I met Christ. All these people come to believe in Jesus. The hour came when, she, when Jesus, the Christ, Messiah, came to her, came into her. Came, she was able to receive him as the Christ. That's the hour. Let me ask you. Let me ask us. Has that hour, that hora, come to you already? If it, if it did, can you say amen? amen? So are you going to your town to evangelize? Say amen? No? <laughs> See, the Jesus that she came to realize, came to meet, a Jew, and then the Lord, then prophet, and then the Messiah, Christ. She had come to the well with heavy load, but she was able to go back with joy and new life. You might have come to this church today with heavy load. I sincerely pray that you and I will be able to go back with joy and new life. Amen. She became a witness of Jesus. Lastly, third point. There's uh, Apostle John uh, in the Gospel of John uh, presents these people who meet Jesus and believe in Jesus and become witnesses. And then contrasts or compares with somebody near that passage that meets Jesus in a similar way, but does not believe. And I mentioned earlier, it's Nicodemus compared to the Samaritan woman. The one compared to the Samaritan woman. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus comes with a confession. He acknowledges that Jesus is a good teacher, sent from God, and he does the things that's, that other people cannot do. And he recognizes that it's from God. However, that stays that way. Nicodemus doesn't really confess and even Jesus frustrated says, I shared this earlier, how can you believe? If you cannot believe when I speak the earthly things, how can you believe? How will you believe if I speak of the heavenly things? And in verse 10 he says, as a teacher, do you not even know this? What's the difference between the Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman? Status and identity. Nicodemus was a Pharisee and a ruler. The Samaritan woman was a Samaritan and an unclean woman. About their faith, Nicodemus came acknowledging to an extent, to a point about Jesus. Samaritan woman did not even expect Jesus. He didn't even, she didn't even know who he, who he was. Spiritual time of meeting Jesus, Nicodemus came at night. And many theologians say that John is presenting this day and night theme to represent their spiritual state. Judas, when he went out to betray Jesus, it was at night time. John chapter 13. Nicodemus came at night. But this woman met Jesus in the daytime. An outcome of faith, Nicodemus says, it doesn't, it doesn't say that Nicodemus believed. Rather, Jesus says, how will you believe? 
But the Samaritan woman came to believe in Jesus as Christ. Who was in a better position to believe in Jesus? Nicodemus. But it was so hard for him to put down, put off that makeup. Because that makeup was Pharisee, ruler, rich, everything recognized. He was a, it, it was not easy to put that off. As conclusion, through this Samaritan woman, Jesus shows us the effect of the water in the tabernacle. See, even with Nicodemus, Jesus says, you have to be born again with water and spirit. With the Samaritan woman, Jesus says, I am the giver of that water. You receive that water. And she received it, and she received the spirit to understand Christ. So we are are going through this part as continuation from last week, that Jesus is the restoration of that tabernacle. And Jesus says, I am the water. And that water he presents to this woman. And when we, we, our journey is to go through that tabern- into that tabernacle to the place of life where our Father is and meet with Him and receive that life. First thing, here, the water. Not the first thing, but water. And what does the water do? What Jesus did to the woman. Washes us. Renews us. And give us, gives us His Holy Spirit. I sincerely pray that you and I may be washed. How does it happen? Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And they said, Oh, shameful, shameful. Please don't, don't, don't. Right? But Jesus said, Unless you do this, you have nothing to do with me. Unless you do this, you cannot go into the kingdom of God. To Nicodemus, he said, Without being being born again through water and spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. You cannot enter into the holy place. So I sincerely pray that you and I will receive that water today. He will wash us clean. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this time. Father, we come here with heavy load. We come here with shameful selves, deep inside the things that we are trying to hide, even the sins. But Father, we pray that you will wash us. Give us that water. May we be able to meet Jesus. And Jesus, through this word, through your word, May we be washed clean. Help, please free us from the bondage. Help us to find that freedom from, from sin and from death. And may we be able to breathe, Father. Help us to breathe. It's suffocating in this world. We don't have any more room in our hearts and minds. But Father, please allow us to discard all the unnecessary burden. And we believe that you will make the load lighter. Take away that load. And help us to be like the Samaritan woman. Help us to leave our fleshly and human means like the water pot and go back with joyful heart. Thank you so much for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give thanks to God.